On the first day of Sukkot, we commemorate the birth of Messiah Yeshua. And the birth of Messiah Yeshua harkens back, actually, to the creation of the world. Let's kind of compare scripture here and kind of get a good handle on this. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was chaos and waste. In other words, it was lifeless. It says the earth was chaos and waste. Darkness was on the surface of the deep. Surface of the deep implies that the world was just one glob of water. That there was chaos and devastation due to a pre-edemic flood destro destroying a pre-edemic world. So it was a lifeless sphere of water. And it says, the Ruach Elohim, or the Spirit of God, was hovering over the surface of the water. Hovering. The picture is like a mother hen extending her wings to protect her young. So that's the picture we get in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and uh, uh, 2. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. It's talking about the conception of Mary, Miriam, as she's known in Hebrew. Now, it's believed that Yeshua was actually conceived during Hanukkah, because nine months after Hanukkah is Sukkot. So it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. So. This is where the angel Gabriel visits Miriam, that is Mary, and tells her that she's going to conceive a child. Now she says, how am I going to conceive a child? I have not known a man. I have not been intimate with a man. In other words, what she's saying is that her womb is lifeless and barren. And what is a womb but a glob or a sphere of water, if you will? Are you starting to see the parallels between Genesis 1 and Luke chapter 1? regarding the birth of Messiah or the conception of Messiah. So in Luke 135, it says, In responding, the angel said to her, The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you, and the power of Elyon, the Almighty, will overshadow you. So what was overshadowing her lifeless, barren, dark, watery womb? The Holy Spirit, just like in Genesis 1. Therefore, the Holy One being born will be called Ben Elohim, that is the Son of God. Now, during the creation week, or the recreation week, I should say, what's the first thing that he calls into being, that God calls into being? Let there be light. Light is equivalent to life. Wherever there is light, there is likely life, and life is dependent upon light. And it's interesting that modern science has, able, has been able to record visually through video the moment of conception, the moment the, egg, the, the sperm penetrates the egg to fertilize it. Scientists don't know why, but when that occurs, there is a flash of light, believe it or not. A flash of light at the moment of conception. So we're seeing parallels between Genesis 1 and Luke chapter 1. Now, also in John, in John chapter 1, it talks about Yeshua being the light of the world. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is capitalized, and it's referring to Yeshua the Messiah, pre-incarnate, that he was there at creation. He was actually the agent of creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him. And apart from him, nothing was made that had come into being. In him was life. So we see the word life here, and we're going to see here the word light. And we see the connection? Wherever there's light, there's life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. So even John 1, we see a connection to Genesis 1, therefore seeing a, a connection to Luke chapter 1. 
I think these things are most fascinating, especially to read and delve into and to discover on the very first day of Sukkot. Now, there's another parallel that I would like to make, this one with uh, the birth of Moses. Now, Moses was a messianic figure, if you will. He was a foreshadowing of the Messiah because Moses was a miraculous birth because he was birthed uh, to very old parents in a very dangerous time. And uh, he ended up becoming the deliverer of Israel from the bondage and slavery of Egypt. Yeshua was born under very similar circumstances, and Yeshua came first to deliver us from the bondage and slavery of sin. So, Moses being a messianic figure, he was when he was born, he was sought to be killed by Pharaoh. In likewise manner, Yeshua was sought to be killed by Herod. In Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 16, it reads, Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, that is the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the boys in Bethlehem and all the surrounding areas from two years old and under, according to the time he had determined from the Magi. Then was fulfilled what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and loud wailing, Rachel sobbing for her children, and refused to be comforted because they were no more. So what did they do when Moses was born and Moses' life was being sought? We know that he was hid away. He was hid away in a basket in the bulrushes of Egypt. And likewise, Yeshua was hidden in Egypt as well, because God told Joseph in a dream that the life of the child was being sought after, to be snuffed out, and he was commanded in that dream to go to Egypt. Interesting. But what happened in Moses' day, uh, Pharaoh ordered all the baby boys to be thrown into the Nile, all the baby boys to be killed. And so we see the parallel with the life of Moses and the life of Messiah. Now, let's move on to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is uh, talking about the, the uh, last day of Sukkot. See, what, well, it talks about the, the, the whole week of Sukkot, really. So in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now it happened in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to register all the world's inhabitants. This was the first census taken when Cyrenus was governor over Syria. Everyone was traveling to be registered in his own city. So this census took place during Sukkot. Why? Because the rulers of Israel at that time, the uh, occupational rulers, they knew that all Israel would be coming together for Sukkot because it was commanded to return to Jerusalem, which was a pilgrimage festival. Everybody went back to their hometowns, and those who could would go back to Jerusalem because there were three pilgrimage festivals. It was commanded to appear before the Lord at the temple and the future tabernacle, which was Passover, uh, Sukkot, and Pentecost or Shavuot. And so, you know, Caesar and Cyrenus thought, well, hey, let's hit two birds with one stone. If they're already going to be here, let's just do a census to boot. So we see that when Mary was uh, carrying Yeshua, she was ready to, to give birth, and they tried to find a place to stay. There was no room for them in the inn. So, they, so the nativity scene, they stayed in what looked like a sukkah. It was an outdoor shelter. And you see modern-day nativity scenes during the holidays, and it looks just like a sukkah, a three-sided shelter with a slanted roof that you could see through. And Yeshua was born under that. And so the word which became flesh and tabernacled among us was born in a tabernacle, a booth, a sukkah. The bread of life, Yeshua, was born in the city of bread, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he was laid in what? A manger, which is a feeding trough. Which, what do you put in a feeding trough? Grain to feed animals. What is grain used for? Grain is used to make bread. See how this all fits and connects together? So, um, that's the first day of Sukkot. Now, the eighth day of Sukkot 
The first day is like a Sabbath. The eighth day also is like a Sabbath. So what if, if Yeshua was born the first day of Sukkot, what was commanded by the law of Moses to happen on the eighth day? The child was to be circumcised and dedicated to the Lord, and his parents, being Torah obedient, did exactly that. It says in Luke 2, 21, when eight days had passed for his brit malah, which is his, his circumcision, he was named Yeshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of their purification were fulfilled according to the Torah of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem and presented him before Adonai. This was his baby dedication, if you will. As it is written in the Torah of Adonai, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to Adonai. So they offered a sacrifice according to what was said in the Torah of Adonai, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This indicates that Yeshua's parents were poor. That was a poor man's sacrifice. If you were poor and you couldn't afford the more expensive sacrifices from the, from the flocks and the herds, you were to bring pigeons or doves. So this indicated that he was raised in a very poor family. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and pious, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was on him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Anointed One, which is the Mashiach, the Messiah of Adonai, the Christ, if you will, in Greek. So the Spirit, uh, so in the Spirit, Simon came into the temple, and when the parents had brought the child Yeshua to do to him according to the custom of the Torah, Simon received him into his arms and offered a baracha, that is a blessing, to God, saying, Now may you let your servant go in peace, O sovereign master, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were marveling at these things that were said about him. And Simeon offered a baracha over them and said to Miriam, his mother, Behold, this one is destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that is opposed. So, thoughts of, uh, so the thoughts of many hearts may be uncovered. And even you, a sword will pierce through your soul. Now Anna, a daughter of uh, Panuel, of the tribe of Asher, was a prophetess. She was well advanced in age, having lived with a husband only seven years, and then she was widowed until age 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day, fasting and prayer. And coming up at that very instant, she began praising God and speaking about the child to all those waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary completed everything according to the Torah of Adonai, Notice his parents kept the law of Moses. They were obedient. They were Torah observant. It says they returned to Galilee to their own city in Nazareth, and the child growing and and the child kept growing and became strong and filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is a little hint about Samuel, the first uh, uh, priestly Nazarite prophet and judge of Israel. Because the, almost the identical words are used. Remember, Samuel's mother had problems conceiving. She was barren. She prayed and miraculously became impregnated. She said she was going to dedicate that child to the Lord. When the child was born and weaned, brought him to Eli, the priest, and he became a priest. He, he you know, was trained as a priest. He was a Nazarite, a lifelong Nazarite. He didn't cut his hair or, or touch dead things or drink the drink grapes or have anything to do with grapes. And he became the first prophet uh, of that time and, and um, a priestly judge of Israel prior to the kingly dynasty beginning with King Saul and transferring that to David. So it was said of Samuel that he grew in wisdom and in favor with God and man, same as Yeshua. So we see that Moses and Samuel were both precursors, foreshadowings, both messianic figures that pointed to Yeshua that was to come. And we're reading the fulfillment of that in Luke chapter 2. This has been this year's revelation from the Sukkah for Sukkot, day 1, 5783. Shalom and God bless. Chag Sameach Sukkot. Happy Sukkot.